Hello class, and welcome to the class. I believe that I have quite a few students in this class, although <laughs> it's changing all the time due to the coronavirus uh, and everything else, and people who decided originally to be virtual then came to campus, and others that have uh, been on, decided to come to campus, but then have decided, uh, even though they're on campus, they wanna do everything virtual. So there's a lot of flux. I'm actually making this uh, video uh, after I've done 15 of your lectures, your online lectures that you're going to be doing. Um, and I've put the syllabus together. It's August 15th, so it's relatively early. Um, but I wanted to do this lecture zero to welcome you into the class. And to, uh, I'm Professor Grenquist. And to also point out that this is probably the singular most important technical class that you're going to have. I mean, besides math and stuff, uh, in your education here at Wentworth. And you want to pay attention. Now, I've been doing this for 40 years and I know how to teach network theory one <laughs> very well. Uh, I want to go over, you should all have received my, my uh, blank sheet of paper, no, my syllabus by now. And um, what I want to do is I want to uh, just go through that syllabus. Um, if you look at it, that's our, our course, ELEC 2250. Uh, that's my name up in the upper left-hand corner, uh, Scott Grenquist. Uh, my office, if I was in my office, but, uh, uh, you know, because coronavirus will be running around all university campuses in Boston, I'm not even exactly sure how long they'll stay open before, you know, the COVID increases uh, mean that we have to close down again. And, and of course, uh, I could revisit this later on and realize that, oh, my God, no, they got the vaccine September 1st and everything uh, uh, was fine. However, let's go through this. Uh, course description. Uh, but, uh, office hours, by the way, get in touch with me, send me an email, contact me on email. That's what you're gonna do most of the time anyway. And my email address is right up there on the syllabus that you have in your hands and are going over with me. Hmm, that is a delicious tea. Course description, the fundamental concepts of current, voltage, and power are studied along with the properties of passive circuit elements, resistor, capacitor, inductor, as well as network theorems, mesh analysis, nodal analysis, maximum power transfer theorem, Thevenin's theorem, Norton's theorem, right? Transient analysis, RL, RC, and RLC circuits and initial conditions are studied, right? So basically, um, if I'm charging a capacitor DC, how does that look like? Well, how does it start out? How does the voltage and the current in that circuit change over time? The same thing is true with uh, an inductor, except an inductor works exactly the opposite of a capacitor. Uh, so, you know, we'll be seeing those things in an RLC circuits, which uh, for, you know, there they're are also filter circuits. Uh, when you get to network theory two, you'll be using RC low pass and high pass filters. You'll be using RL high pass and low pass filters. Actually, we use RC more so than RL um, for a variety of reasons. And then RLC, which are really delta filters, where those are band pass filters or, I'm getting ahead of myself. But anyway, though, th this is just the course description and initial conditions are studied. Laboratory experiments, parallel classroom theory and include circuit simulation. And that might not be as true uh, this semester as it is and has been in previous semesters due to the coronavirus. 
I, I have, I think, seven students that are in my laboratories, my video virtual laboratories, that are not in my virtual classes. And because of that, I, I you know, with some, just the introductory labs, uh, I may require those students to actually look at a couple of the lectures that I have on YouTube in the Scott Grenquist channel to prepare you for the lab. And that's really only the first lab, which is on dimensions and units and something that's very important uh, for engineers um, to know. Uh, and so I've, I always do a first lab uh, in that. The very, you know, it's an easy lab, it's a paper lab. So you will be, uh, actually I shouldn't say you will be because pe people are probably not watching this that are in the laboratory. So uh, I'll have to talk to them in the lab. Actually what I'll do is since they are in the lab, I will require them to watch lecture zero as well as lectures one, two, three. That really you don't need all three of those, but uh, uh, lecture one anyway, uh, before they do lab one. And I've already put the first two labs together and um, you know the other labs I've, I've more or less put together too, but another instructor mentioned that he made up uh, virtual labs, who's teaching virtually. He made up virtual labs for all of the labs and you know, I, I may end up using Sam Zeman's uh, uh, labs. I haven't looked at them yet, so I haven't decided. <laughs> Let's keep going through uh, the syllabus. Course goals and objectives. Demonstrate the understanding of electric charge, current, voltage, and power. Pretty easy. Recognize basic electrical components, including independent and dependent sources, resistors, capacitors, inductors, and apply their electrical characteristics to circuit analysis. You know, I, uh, I'll, I'll look at independent, uh, your book is looking at dependent sources and stuff. Uh, yeah, dependent sources, read about it in your book. Uh, independent sources are things that are, are much more used in um, circuit applications and real circuits. All right. Uh, I won't go into, you know, you know I, I may touch on in the lectures, uh, dependent sources and, and work they work, but I may not give you too many uh, homework problems on that. Okay. Recognize the basic circuit configurations, including series, parallel, delta, and Y connections. All of those lectures are already done. And apply DC circuit analysis to them, and, and, and boy, those lectures are done. Start looking at the lectures. Uh, uh, they're, they're pretty good lectures. Perform DC circuit analysis using the basic laws, Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's voltage law, Kirchhoff's current law, nodal mesh me uh, analysis methods, circuit theorems, which are, like I say, Norton's and Thevenin's and the power transfer uh, theorem, including superposition. Uh, very simple. You know, so it's got superposition, Thevenin, Nor Norton's, all the things that I've already mentioned, source transformation, and maximum power transfer, and of course, that's, uh, those are all the things that I, I, I already mentioned <laughs> that I was going to be covering anyway. Uh, perform calculus-based transient analysis on first and second order circuits. No problem. That's really looking at the transient response for capacitors uh, and inductors and an RLC, which is a resistor, capacitor, and inductor uh, in series circuit. Analyze DC circuits using circuit simulation software. Again, not too hard. You know what's missing in here, though, is uh, they should have something where it says introduction to AC circuit theory. That's one thing that we always have included in network theory, and that's what I'm going to include, too, to give you, because this is really an introduction, right? It's a fundamental course, but, but then we want, you know, this is a stepping stone to network theory, too. Network theory two is where you then learn a whole new mathematics, and that's complex numbers. Now, you've probably seen complex numbers in high school uh, and in your other uh, calculus-based courses that you've had in mathematics here at Wentworth prior to getting here, but that's what it is. 
And so I usually use the last three lectures or, or whatever to uh, really start to get into AC network theory so that you've got all of the stuff that we've got here, but also you have two or three introductory courses uh, to see what you're going to be getting into in network theory too. And that gives you a huge uh, uh, advantage when you get into network theory too. This stuff that's up to the, this, this is so easy. I'm going to tell you right now, the the greatest, um, I mean, this is really a, the greatest fundamental course you're going to have, but this is really the stepping stone then into network theory too. And network theory too, of course, is the stepping stone then into analog circuits. And analog circuits is the stepping stone into motor understanding motors and controls which are really dealing with capacitors inductors resistors you know the whole the whole thing so so you look at that in power transmission you know the power transmission that we have nowadays isn't digital <laughs> no it's not it's analog that's what's coming out of your wall and powering your refrigerator so you know this is this is an introduction network theory 2 is really doing the same things here, but with a different mathematical uh, foundation. So instead of using regular real numbers like we're using in this course, once you get out of resistors and into inductors and capacitors, you then have to use complex numbers. And so the last three lectures or whatever it comes out to with, I, I would say about 50 lectures that I'm going to put up on YouTube. So. What you want to do for the lectures is just go to YouTube, search for the Scott Grenquist channel, and then go in and look at everything that's under DC network theory. Right, I've also uh, got courses on AC network theory, the sort of a, a short course on that, 16 lectures. And then I have uh, another course there on electromagnetic field theory, which has about 50 uh, lectures in it. And if uh, you want to, know anything about electromagnetic field theory or what you're going to get into your senior year if you're an electrical engineer, go ahead and, and, and uh, look at the lectures there and think, oh my God, how am I going to get from where I am now <laughs> mathematically up to triple integrals over uh, volume areas? Uh, you know, yeah, that's right. Maxwell's equations, which I want to point out here and give you the punchline. Maxwell's equations really aren't Maxwell's equations, are they? No, they're two Gauss's equations, two of Gauss's equations, one Faraday equation, and then one Ampere equation. The only thing that Maxwell did, well, he did two things. He, he added on to Ampere's equation, right? He took Ampere's equation just out of wires and then actually extended that to electric fields. And that's a great addition. But the thing that he was so good at is that he immediately, um, with his mathematical knowledge, huge mathematical knowledge, that he um, realized that 1 over v squared, uh, that when he, he did the equations, he came out with the wave, the wave equation. And he immediately realized that, oh my God, light is an electromagnetic wave phenomena. Not only that, even though th other things like x-rays and stuff had been discovered by that point, they really weren't understood. And they really didn't know that this is just an extension of the electromagnetic, you know, they're all electromagnetic waves. X-rays are electromagnetic. They had no idea. <laughs> it's just a wave phenomena. And so, uh, you know, that, uh, there's so much to learn. There's so much to learn. Electromagnetic field theory, um, you know, all of your computer courses and everything. But this is the beginning. Network theory one is the beginning. And that's why I want to look at, uh, well, let's just keep going through here. Student outcomes, that's really for ABET accreditation. Uh, the uh, Accreditation Board of Engineering and Technology accredits our undergraduate programs like they do every place. Uh, that's just for them. Credit hours, three, two, four, uh, class type. And it says we meet from 11 to 12, 20 p.m. Monday and Wednesdays. 
uh, on one of those days. In the beginning, we'll be meeting both of, both of those days for just uh, to, just so that I can make sure that everybody's keeping up with the lectures that are going to be on YouTube on the Scott Grenquist channel. And that's right, you have to confirm with me that you have seen these lectures. I also have analytics on YouTube that tells me uh, how many people have seen a lecture, how long they watched the lecture. So I can keep track of uh, you watching the lectures. And I'm probably gonna have you subscribe to the channel because that then shows me, that then tells me when a subscriber has shown up and how long and, and which of the lectures, which of the videos he's watched, he or she has watched and for how long they watched it. So I can keep track of your commitment and your confirmation of watching a certain amount of lectures. All right, we'll talk more about that when we meet. Uh, prerequisite, I'm sure everybody's got the prerequisites. No one came to my office and uh, as far as I know and asked me for a, uh, you know, to, to sign them into the course without the prerequisite. Pedagogical approach, teaching strategies, I'm gonna let you look at that. Uh, Fundamentals of Electric Circuits by C.K. Alexander and M.N.O. Sadiku. Now, uh, I've written down there that you can use any of the editions from the fifth edition to the seventh edition. This happens to be the fifth edition, I think, right here. And this was uh, one of the editions that they had. I think I've got the sixth edition, uh, you know, in my office at work, too. But um, this is the fifth edition, and I also have the solution sets for the fifth edition. So this is the edition that I'm going to be sending the problems for your homework. I will scan in the problems out of the problem sections in here, and then I will send them out to you. I also am going to uh, send out, excuse me, I'm just picking up a little dirt. I, I found a on the floor there. Um, I'm also gonna be sending out to you a resource for this. And, and that resource is going to be the solutions to the homework problems that I sent out to you. And, the, and, and that's what I want you to use this as. I usually would put this in the um, reference desk at the library and you'd have to go in and sign it out and I can find out how many people have, but I can't do that now. So. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm sending this out for you as a resource so that, only, you know, try to work the problems out. That's where you're actually going to get the experience of problem solving. And then uh, if you can't, if you get stuck on that, refer to the resource, right? And make sure that you check that. I also ask students that, you know, check, check your answers at the end. The, the homework, uh, as you can see, is 15% of your grade. But, but where would you fall down on that, right? Everybody's gonna send the homework in. You've got the homework solutions right there, so how could anybody get any homework problems wrong? It's almost impossible, unless you go out of your way to not check your homework with the answers that are in the resource manual, uh, then you could get some wrong. And you know what else, though, what I found? Some people, uh, say to themselves, God, you know, filling out all that homework or, or, or if I even did the, the least effort by just copying it out of the resource manual. That's a lot of writing. I don't wanna do that. So they don't send it in. I remind them over the course of the semester that, uh, hey, you gotta get that homework into me. That's 15% of your grade, right? So eventually I'm gonna get everybody's homework. If you don't do the homework, it's not gonna really prepare you for the tests, uh, which I'm, I'm getting to, getting to the tests. Um, so, uh, you know, resource, I'll let you look at that. Lab studio, uh, we are gonna have lab reports for the various different labs. You're gonna send those in to me. I'm gonna grade those. So laboratories are gonna be part of your grade uh, as well. Wentworth attendance policy, um, you know, I. I they they require us to put that in there, but obviously uh, this uh, semester and last semester, that doesn't really apply. So assignment submitted work, uh, late work, you're going to give me all of your homeworks. 
you're going to give me all of your lab reports. And I want to point this out as to why. I grade on a curve, don't I? That's right. Now, with a test or an examination, the midterm exam, the final exam, the three tests, that's really a Gaussian distribution. But I'm going to make these harder than I probably usually would because you're going to have a whole day rather than just an hour to finish this test or these examinations. I'll talk more about that in a second. But uh, you're going to finish them and you're going to get them to me. Or if you miss one, now let's face it, if, if you do the lab, how can you not get 30 out of 30? Well, you can't. So the only way is to not hand in the lab to lose 30 points. Now, what that does is that changes the Gaussian distribution like I have on examinations and tests and changes it into a Poisson distribution. Now, a Poisson distribution is much more narrow. And to figure out the variance and then take the standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance, is much thinner. And so whereas uh, on a test, the Gaussians distributed over the entire cohort of students that are taking the test, what you can see in a Poisson distribution where, some, where, where students would have the solutions and all they have to do really is copy the solutions out of the resource manual onto their homework. Uh, everybody's gonna get those right. And so that Poisson distribution really then creates the fact that if you do everything, if you, if you give me all the homework assignments and they're all correct, you can only get a B. That's right, because everybody's gotten all the homework assignments and all of them are all correct, so you can only get a B. But let's say that you miss handing in one home set assignment. Then your B goes to a C. It, you know, and this is just the, the curve that I grade on. Uh, if you were to miss two, if you were to miss handing in two homework or laboratory reports, your B would then go to an F. So do you see what I'm saying here? That you have to. And, and the reason that I, I say that is if you look on the next page, you'll see that homework is 15% of your grade. Lab work is 15% of your grade. So if you were not to, if you were just to miss handing in two labs, and let's say you were to miss handing in two home sets, you would have an F for 30% of your grade. Right? So why instead don't you do the homework and do the lab <laughs> reports and then just not show up for the midterm exam and not show up for the first test or the last test or the middle test? You could do that. That's just as irresponsible and unaccountable as missing the home sets. In fact, it's so much harder, isn't it? And I know there's some of you out there that are saying, oh, God, I'm not too good on tests right now. You know, I better do all those homeworks and I better get in all those lab reports because I want, it, I want that definite B for 30% of my grade. And if all I have to do is hand in the homework and hand in the lab reports, that's the easy part. Anybody can do that. I just have to write the things up, right? So it amazes me that there are some people that, that for one reason or another uh, don't do that. You're going to have a lot of homework, and you're going to have labs that are going to require lab write-ups and, and lab write-ups being sent in to me. So uh, get busy on those. Uh, let me see if I've just covered everything on the, the oh yeah, here we go, um, uh, the tests. Now, I'm going to give you the tests on Mondays. And, and in that way, what I'm really going to do, since we have class from uh, 11 to 12, 20, what I'm going to do is on Sunday at noon, I'm going to give you the test. And, you know, some of you are, are working, you know, have, have jobs or, or whatever it is, uh, 
So uh, I'm assuming that Sunday would be a day that you would have some time off. And if you don't, then Monday morning uh, you can do the test or the exam too. Um, that should not be too much of a problem. And there's your uh, uh, grade composition. 10% for each test, three tests. Homework, 15%. Lab work, 15%. I've made them high enough that you've got to do them to, to do well in the course. Midterm examination, 15%. Right, so that's only 5% more than the thing, but it's, it's important. The midterm exam and the final exam are cumulative. So uh, at the midterm exam, you're gonna have everything all the way back to the beginning of the course. On all exams, midterm and final, you'll have four problems. Those problems will have numerous subsections, but you'll have four problems. On the tests, you will have three problems. All right? So tests are three, exams are four problems. I want to talk to you. Uh, I've got something down the class communication will be all, all be email predominantly of what you're sending in to me. You'll scan things in, send them in. Uh, important dates, no, no class on Columbus and Veterans Day, Thanksgiving recess, and then the last day of class is December 8th, uh, although I don't think we're, we're meeting on that day or whatever. What, what is that? Let's see. That is a Tuesday. So no. Um, academic conduct and honesty. There's no way that I can proctor the test or the exams. I can't be there. If I was in Wentworth, I always make sure that I'm, I'm in the room the whole time. I'm proctoring the test. I'm watching people take the test. Nobody can use their phone or their computer. And, and I'm watching it, and I'm, I'm sure that you know everybody's um, I'm hoping that that's not going to be an issue. This is an important class for you. You want to put as much time and effort into understanding everything in this class that you possibly can. I, I expect you to be doing the test yourself, even though I'm giving you plenty of time. And I expect you... you I'm going to let, allow you to use the book uh, in addition to the formula cards, because if I say no, no, you can't use the book, then there's going to be some people that, for one reason or another, they can't remember a constant or something like that. Uh, it's not like you're sitting in class where you can raise your hand and say, Professor Grenquist, I've just forgotten what the value of pi is, which you never would want to say to me. <laughs> um, but you know, I'm, I, I, some people will use it no matter what anyway. And, and in fact, they won't really look at that as, as cheating because it's something that they could ask me in class and I would gladly give them the information. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna say, do this. Try to get as, you know, as much out of this uh, as you can. Uh, do not collaborate with anybody else whether it's another student in class or it's your father who happens to be an electrical engineer sitting in the other room. Uh, this is, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make this, there's no way that I can say to you, I'm going to have a meeting and I want all of you to have your video up so that I can watch all of you. Because I know that some of you are in situations uh, where the turning the video on is, is not your purview. Right, you might be at your, you're living at your parents' house or your grandmother's or whatever it is, or with some other students in an apartment. And if any of those students say, no, I don't want you to turn that on. They see my apartment. Um, you cannot do that, right? And I, I, I know, and although I know professors that have four students, you know, it's, 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 it's crazy. I'm not going to do that. People find themselves in different situations, especially with virtual. So that's what I'm doing. And I'm hoping that everybody, you know, does the work themselves and gets it into me. Um, I'm going to give you a full 24 hours to do the test. 
So I want your best effort and your best work. All right. You're going to be doing a lot of reading too. So, you know, find uh, th th this, by the way, I, I think is, is a PDF on, uh, you're going to also be using this for network theory too, but, uh, and, and I'm holding up the fifth edition when there's a seventh edition out and they only put that out. So I don't even know why it's, it's virtually the same book. So wh whichever edition you want, fifth, sixth or seventh, that, that's fine. Um, I'm going to be giving you the problems out of the fifth and then I'm going to be giving you the resource uh, solutions out of the fifth edition. And those, I found those online in like two minutes. So it would be crazy for me to think that in industrious, efficient students aren't also going to find those things in two minutes on the web. And so if I were to say, oh no, it's a seventh edition and you've got to, no, you would, some of you would find that. And then some of you would have that resource and some of you wouldn't. So this way, at least I know everybody is playing with the same deck and we're all trying to learn network theory and we're all trying to do good on the, the home sets, but really it's getting all of those in. And if you wanna be proactive, since I've already sent you an email at this point in time with all of the homework assignments throughout the entire semester, right? I've already sent you that and I've sent you the resource. So I uh, start doing those homework problems. Start doing the homework problems, which are really what I'm using those for is your self-learning, your lifelong learning, your self-learning is going to be doing those homework problems. And, and especially in the first two chapters, a lot of those are relatively easy. So, you know, do them, don't look at the solutions and then just check your answers with the solutions to make sure that you're doing everything right. You know, there's a lot more self-directed learning in this environment with coronavirus than there would be with me spoon feeding knowledge to you. And that, we, we never do that anyway. I mean, knowledge is constructed in all of our own framework inside our minds and all of our minds have a different constructive framework. So uh, there's no way I can pour my knowledge into your brain. What I do is I facilitate your learning. I know how to do that after 40 years of teaching. All right, let's uh, go down. Now the lecture syllabus, I'm going to actually set up. I haven't really finished uh, redoing all of that for this semester. So I'm gonna talk spe uh, uh, specifically about the lecture syllabus and the lab syllabus that you find in your syllabus uh, in lecture 0 0.5. This is lecture zero, welcome to the class. In lecture 0 0.5, I'm going to go through the lecture syllabus and just talk about you know, how those fit in to the course. I'll also talk about the lab syllabus because I haven't put all of the labs together. I still have to wait for Sam to get in touch with me and to see how his multi-SIM uh, and electronic workbench, um, I think they were multi-SIM mainly, and he's just done them all simulation. Now, I want to do them with simulation, but also show you on a cadet board what's happening. Also, maybe at the end of the semester, there'll be one or two labs that would actually use some other device that they haven't been able to procure for this course uh, and do things, you know, hands-on at home. I, I don't know how that's going to work. No one knows. No one has been able to get us the device. Uh, so, you know, I, uh, we, will, we, we will only try to fold that in if and when we get the device. Right now, they're telling us that it's not even gonna be in until the end of October. So uh, I, I, can't, I can't put a course together on something that's not even gonna be here. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to try to put these together in a cadet board and do various different uh, labs. All right. Uh, all lab retorts should include, and you can see over on the last page now on the syllabus that we're on, all lab reports should include the cover page and introduction of which, which I put a format, a framework of that in the syllabus so that you can see. Equipment and component list. Well, obviously, you know, when we do it, uh, I will give you the equipment and component list, 
for labs where we're putting together various different circuits so that you can put those into your lab report. Schematic of the circuit. Well, you'll still be able to put that in your lab report. Discussion of the experiment. Results that were obtained. And these will be my results that I'm obtaining when I'm working on the cadet board and everything else so that you can then. Conclusion and results. And then significance of the conclusion. Now, why do I ask for all of those things? Because all of those different topical areas are also areas that are used in conference papers or journal papers. So when you're writing those out, I'm trying to use this to help you with your written communication structure so that you realize the things that would have to go into a conference or a um, journal paper you know, just sort of the things. And of course, significance of the conclusion, that's, that's what really, that's the outcome of the research. And so I want you to, to put all those together. Um, if you look below that, all homework should be turned in on quadrille paper. Now, what is quadrille paper? I just happen to have quadrille. In fact, what I do the lectures on is quadrille paper. I'm just going to hold so that you can see what quadrille paper is. This happens to be quadrille paper in an engineering notebook. I have about 100 of these. Uh, you'll, you'll have engineering notebooks too. In fact, wh why is the engineering notebook larger than a sheet of paper? I'm gonna hold this up. See, wh why is it larger than a sheet of paper? That's right, MIT guys are smart. They're the ones that put these books together <laughs> for the first time, right? It's larger than an eight by 10, 11 and a half, an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper because I could tape it in here, couldn't I? I could tape it in here. And let's say that I'm working on something that's patentable. So I take this correspondence that I have from uh, Bell Labs or whatever, uh, Shockley, and I, I tape this in here, right? Him giving me permission to use something or other. And then, and then what I would do after I tape it in is I would sign. I would sign across here and I would have someone else sign across here as a witness that I, and date this, that I put this in here on this date, right? And then that, when a patent officer was going back, he would see that, oh, okay, well, this is where he came up with that idea on that date. Uh, well, that was two months before the other guy put his patent application, uh, you know, claims that he put his patent, uh, you know, did it. Uh, uh, realized it, so you get the patent rather than him. You see, so, so and you're going to be working with companies where you are working on patentable um, proprietary devices, and so you know you've got to uh, learn how to use an engineering notebook too. That's not what I'm trying to teach you right here. What I'm trying to teach you right here is how to use quadrille paper. We also call it engineering paper. And you can buy reams of it. I, I buy it at dollar stores. Anytime I go in a dollar store and I see quadrille paper, I, I grab like every single ream of that quadrille paper and take it home so I can give it to students. All right. So your homework's going to be in on that quadrille paper. A lot of times you'll see it in green. You can get a whole pad of it for green. Of course, you're going to have the quadrille on the front side and the green, you use the back side of it because then you can see the grid through the paper and you're, you're, you're writing on the paper, but there's no grid on that side of the paper, is it? So that when you photocopy it, it looks like you're the, uh, the, the best writer <laughs> in the world, the best printer in the world. And of course we all are, because you know, we take drafting. <sighs> Where did that go, right? Now, now engineers can't, can't write any better than doctors. Okay, all, all homework be turned in on quadrille paper. Have in the upper right-hand corner your name, my name, usually that's at the bottom, my name, uh, the class name and number, and a list of all the problems that are appearing on that homework hand-in so that I know which of the eight homeworks or whatever it is that I give you, you're handing in to me because maybe you're handing it in late. I don't know, God, is this a news homework? Is this a homework from before? So if I have it all up there in the right-hand corner, I know that you're handing it in uh, uh, for me. Also, if you put my name up there, and this happened before I required my name on, home, on homeworks, right? Uh, I would get other people's homework. 
Like they're just handing it in. Oh, oh the hammer. <laughs> Grab it out of my thing. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'd realize this isn't my homework. This is uh, Professor Dasgupta's homework or something. So if my name's up there, when you pull it out of your book, you'll realize, oh, my God, no, uh, I'm giving Professor Grinquist Professor Dasgupta's homework, or I'm giving Professor Dasgupta Professor Grinquist's homework. Better keep it in my folder. Uh, box all problems. I want a box around all problems. I want this to look professional, right? So in this class, I want you to start to become the professional engineer. I want you to write lab reports like you're writing journal papers. And I want you to start handing in your homework, not like scribbles all over it like when you were in high school or something. I want you to start handing in your homework in a professional manner, in a professional engineering manner so that you start to get into that mode, right? Become the engineer. Engineers have very good <laughs> written communication skills, right? So that's what I want to do. Revise grading policy. Uh, you'll see now I, uh, uh, what, I, what I also put on there was letter grade weighting and normalized numerical uh, definition. And by that, by the normalized that I, I put in there, that really means normalized to the curve, whether it's a Poisson curve, whether it's a Gaussian curve. And I have, uh, you know, checked on this time and time again at every, fa I, I was a faculty senator for a long time, every faculty senate meeting, we all agree that, you know, it, this isn't just a, a, a number scheme. This is a, uh, and, and uh, it's interesting, they don't put any percentages on here. So what if I made it out of 200? Made it, what if I made the test out of 200 and the person got a, a 99 out of 200? Does that mean they get an A? So, so this is all, all, all really percentages, and it should be normalized percentages. And, uh, you know, I've, I've uh, talked to everyone. Everyone agrees that it really is normalized after the, the curve is folded in to the test. And so you'll both, most of my uh, number, my, my percentage things coincide almost exactly with this because I put together tests so well. So uh, we'll see how everything works out. Glad to have you in the class. Uh, after this, you probably would want to uh, start doing homework problems. <laughs> That's one thing that you'd like to do. And then also see lecture point five, zero point five, because that's going to go over the lab syllabus and the lecture syllabus. Okay. I don't know how long this is, but I'm sure it's not as long as my normal lectures. Uh, after this, lecture 0 0.5, start working on your home set problems, get those done, start your reading, get that done. All right, see you soon. Oops, wait a second. <laughs> I just realized I forgot to stop the recording. I might have lost, uh, oops. <laughs>